Yeah, no, these verses are very powerful. And um, sometimes they are just a reminder of what we already know to be true. Um, sometimes they are something we've never thought of before. And just, you know, let them strike you how they're striking you. You don't have to force yourself to think any kind of way about it, but kind of consider them with a fresh mind. Um, let's see. And there was one question in the chat. Is the point of desiring these undesirable things that as a bodhisattva, the negative karma can be purified rather than passed on? Well, yes, ish, um, ish. I guess there's a difference between something being purified and something exhausting or finishing. And we sometimes use them as if they're the same thing. Like if you're in a retreat and you have all sorts of obstacles happen, the people at the retreat will say, oh, wonderful purification, wonderful purification. You know, oh, you got sick at a retreat. That's fantastic purification. You otherwise would have to experience that in a hell realm. You know, you hear that kind of thing at Dharma centers. And it, it's like, it's sort of true, but to purify it has to be on purpose, right? To purify it has to be like intentional, you know, with the four opponent powers present or a wisdom realizing emptiness present or something like this. To be exhausted, that's kind of what's happening with us whenever a bad thing or an unwanted thing or a suffering thing happens and we don't react with the negativity. So if someone criticizes us and we don't criticize them back, it doesn't mean we can't be assertive or we can't have a discussion about it, but it means we're not retaliating you know, or you have a headache and then you're also grumpy and you think that being, having a headache and being grumpy are the same thing when in fact they're two separate things. You're just used to smooshing them together, you know, so every time you're grumpy with your headache, you're kind of creating the cause for more suffering in the future. Every time you have a headache and try and keep control over your state of mind so it doesn't affect your mood negatively or your actions of speech and body negatively, then that one finishes, that seed finishes or exhausts. So as a bodhisattva, we have, or we shall have, um, such a positive state of mind that it kind of prevents most of our negative karma from getting germinated. You know, think of karma as like seeds. And when we have a positive state of mind, that creates a very powerful condition for mostly positive seeds to be the ones that ripen. We still have the negative seeds, they're just not getting watered. So that's good news in a sense, in terms of a comfortable life, but in terms of the path, we need hardship in order to develop. And so for a bodhisattva, when they meet a really difficult person who is really hard to live with or work with, they're delighted because normally life is so lovely for a bodhisattva because they're only sprouting their positive seeds. They're like, oh, oh, here's my chance. That's a hard one. You know, I can practice patience now, hooray. Um, it's not like they're seeking out hardship. It's that they know they have the seeds for hardship in their continuum. And when they come up and you deal with them well, they finish and you're not creating more. Excellent. But even more significantly is the mind training that happens in response to the hardship. Because that's creating positive karma, not just getting rid of negative karma. So the two can be accomplished simultaneously, right? You can either just be patient with suffering or you can be patient plus, you know, with a bodhicitta attitude and, you know, really expand the practice. Does it make sense? So, you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, of course we want preemptive strike as well and to purify before negative karma arises as suffering. Um, but if you're someone who has a lot of really excellent conditions and you're surrounded by quite friendly, polite people and there's not a lot that is getting to you, it seems like it's the perfect condition then to practice because, you know, you're not having all this interference and interruption and obstacles. But then if you think about the times in your life where it's been a bit rough, that's when you actually did practice, you know? Like a lot of people think they'll do this and this and this amazing thing once they're retired. But once they're retired, they just kind of blob out and get kind of semi-depressed. You know, <laughs> like it takes a little bit of something to keep you motivated because our nature is kind of to fall into a heap when things are easy. Yeah, or to create drama when things are easy. So hardship is very useful to us. You don't have to frame it as hardship so much as maybe challenges you can rise to. You know, and you can give yourself those challenges or you can see the challenges that are already in your life and approach them from that perspective. Um, 
to develop the mental fortitude. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, resilience and strength. Yep. So um, gradually at a speed that's not gonna create a whiplash or a reaction that's negative or some sort of internal rebellion. Yeah. So, um, okay, so we did aspiring bodhicitta. Now we're gonna do engaging bodhicitta, which is the more hardcore. So we did this one. And um, now when we go into engaging bodhicitta or the bodhicitta of application, it starts with relative bodhicitta and the pre meditation practice of exchanging oneself for others. Okay, and then later it's gonna go into the six perfections, etc. cetera. And um, so verse 11, the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to make a genuine exchange of one's own happiness and well-being for all the suffering of others. Since all misery comes from seeking happiness for oneself alone, whilst perfect Buddhahood is born from the wish for others' good. So if you were talking to viewers who had never heard this worldview, how would you explain it to them so that they wouldn't think that it was an invitation to become a martyr? The, the premise that all suffering comes from desiring your own happiness alone and that all suffering, you know, that, that, that's where suffering comes from is wanting your happiness alone. Do you agree? <laughs> I mean, maybe logically you agree, but experientially? And no, I think it, it makes, you know, demonstrable sense. It's, and I think of one thing in particular, when I get, when I get gripped around money, mm -hmm. I've gotten, you know, I have the good fortune to have enough that I have my basic needs met. But when I get gripped around money, I've gotten into the um, practice of as soon as I have that, I find a way to be generous. And mm. how immediately just the kind of just goes away. So it's, you know, like that feeling like I won't have enough, you know, yeah. I immediately get rid of by, I mean, it comes back endlessly, but, you know, it's delicate yeah like within what you're what you're describing maybe a little bit or no yeah yeah definitely i mean if we're operating from a deprivation mentality we never feel like we have enough and if we're operating from an abundance mentality then you always feel kind of overflowing and very generous and that doesn't stand in opposition to the fact that you need to have a budget and plan and be practical you know, and sometimes, um, especially really young people that come to Dharma centers, like in their late teens and early 20s, they think this means give away everything. And then they become like a burden on the Dharma center. And we're like, all right, let's find you a shirt, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, it's like they, they miss the point that it's mentality, rather than the behavior, and that the essence of generosity in Buddhism is the intention to give, not the actual giving. The actual giving is excellent, but it's a byproduct of a mentality that's far more important because the highest form of generosity is to offer dharma or timely advice when asked, <laughs> and then loving kindness and compassion, and then offering freedom from fear, and then the lowest form of generosity is material goods. You know, So those are all forms of generosity. The first three are non-material at all. And the real generosity is the intention, you know, which is why we do these like offerings like I have. The Buddhas don't need me to make offerings, do they? They're happy. They're fine. They don't need water, right? They don't need me to placate them either. They don't need me to say, oh, I'm very bad and low. Here's some water. Please, Buddhas, help me. You know, like they're helping regardless. They don't care. It's about creating a pattern in my mind that offers something I see as precious, but doesn't trigger the tug of miserliness. So water is very precious. I hold it to be precious, but it also doesn't freak me out to give it because I know I live in a place where I have lots of clean water. So it's enough to create the pathway in my mind of everyday generosity so that hopefully in my daily life, when opportunities for generosity arise, I'm like right in there spontaneously giving without having to stop and think and get myself amped up to do it. I just do it because it's already a habit. 
And I do it for these objects here because they represent my path and we become receptive to what we respect. You know, but I also like try and make dinner for my family sometimes. You know, it's like, don't get lost in the behavior or the outward expression. It's about the mentality. But don't think you can only have the mentality and never let it have an outward expression. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, so this whole premise of equalizing and exchanging self for others and working for the sake of all sentient beings, you're not leaving yourself out. You're not saying all sentient beings accept me. You're putting yourself in the correct perspective. Yeah. And when you put yourself in the correct perspective, there is less pressure on you to get your own kind of well-being under control. Your own well-being actually happens a lot more fluidly. You know, use whatever example you like, but it, the, the idea is that when you expand your mind to think of the group, you're not excluded from the group and your own basic needs get taken care of. But whenever there's something that is uncomfortable or inconvenient, it doesn't worry you as much when you're holding a bigger picture. When you're holding a smaller picture, your own needs becomes a lot bigger deal. Right? Just like in your own personal life, if you have everyday annoyances and then something really big happens like a birth or a death or a new job or a move, a lot of the little things kind of fade to the background just naturally and you don't worry about them the way you do when life is kind of normal and ordinary. So even for yourself, when your mind is more expanded into something bigger and more significant, the little everyday annoyances shrink down to their correct proportion or at least smaller. So this is what his holiness means when he says wise selfishness, that it's in your own best interest to think of the group rather than to think of the individual. It's the opposite of America first, right? It's the opposite of America first, which we know can sound very reassuring and soothing to people who have a deprivation mentality. Yeah, it's very reassuring to think, okay, us first, then maybe we'll think of other countries, but I feel deprivation, so me first. Whereas if you're not identified with that sense of deprivation, you think the world and everything that helps the world helps this country, you know? And it's, you know, it's like, it's not like you're leaving out the country you live in, it's recognizing interdependence and, you know, we're not healthy until everybody's healthy. To equalize and exchange self for others is the heart of Lo Jung practice, that transformation practice. And, um, and so there's just a couple key steps. And then we'll... So the verse 11 is where it's kind of explicitly pointed to, but the whole rest of the text is kind of implied. So what you do, and this is just from the Lam Rim, for those of you that know about the Lam Rim Chenmo. The first thing you do is you contemplate the benefits of exchanging self and other and the faults of not which is very straightforward. It's intellectually very easy, but it can be emotionally quite confronting, especially when you consider the faults of not cherishing others. So if you were to do this, just this one point as its own analysis, how do you think you would approach it? The benefits and the faults. And you're to sit down, okay. How would you meditate analytically if no one was guiding you? Well, I mean, I guess it's just, it's what you were talking about. The idea that if you have like a, a glass of water that gets disturbed, you know, gets jarred, it's going to get super um, disturbed. If you have a, if you have a big lake that has a little disruption, if you drop a rock in a glass of water, it's going to spill everywhere. If you drop it in a massive lake, it's, it's not going to be disturbed so the more vast you can sort of make your mind and your sphere of concern the more um the less less disturbed and as you keep saying kind of like right sizing what's occurring you know and then on like a practical level from the level of inter interdependence I don't know that this is exactly right but but you know I have to care about the whole world or I'm never going to get to go anywhere because we'll keep having this pandemic, you know, like you, like we are all sort of, I mean, I don't think that's exactly this, but you know, there is a sort of enlightened self-interest and, and other people doing well too. I don't, 
you know, I don't know that that's what this is, but that's what came to mind. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, that's the kind of process you want to do is you, you want to relate it to something kind of tangible and something that's, you know, in the news or in your life or in your experience and tie it to that in some way so that there's some kind of like making it personal. You know, so you can think, okay, the benefits of cherishing others for myself are what? For others are what? And then you switch. The faults of not cherishing others to me are what? For them are what? And you just think through it analytically. So before you start, you just have that structure in your mind. I'm looking at self-cherishing and I'm looking at it from my perspective and the worldwide perspective. Okay. So you set your bodhicitta motivation and then you walk yourself through those steps and then you come to the conclusion that you already know you're supposed to come to because you already agree with it, but you're coming to it more deeply with deeper resonance. You know, so what you would do is you would say, all right, so first of all, do I even know what cherishing self means in Buddhism? All right, let's just sit with, what is it? What are we even talking about? Okay, self-cherishing is viewing oneself as primary importance at the expense of others or with indifference to others. So like, like I mentioned yesterday, the little kids on the bus with their backpacks and swinging them around and, you know, knocking each other over, not meaning to, but just with total indifference and kind of oblivious to their impact on other people. So you think, okay, when I am my most self-cherishing, what is it like? You know, and just think to yourself, so kind of half meditating, half reflecting, just kind of think when you're at your worst, like when you've committed to yourself cherishing, when you're in it, you know, the mood has stuck. What do you say to yourself? You know, how does your body feel? And it could be that your thoughts speed up. It could be that they slow down. Doesn't matter either way, just know. Could be that your body tenses up and you get really speedy and busy and tight. Or it could be that you become a total flop like a house cat and just kind of drape yourself over furniture and can't be bothered. Doesn't matter which, just know yourself, you know? When you speak to other people, when you're very self-cherishing, is that when you get very blunt and brisk and task-oriented and just get it done? Or is it when you get kind of passive and whatever and kind of uh, and like that or do you get kind of needy and like hungry for validation and am I good and you're asking am I good in a million different ways do you snack you know what happens like it because everybody is very different in the style that their self-cherishing looks like but it's different to you when you're very rational grounded centered and altruistically motivated can, can you find a distinct difference in your own way of being when you're very self-cherishing in a mood and when you've shaken your head clear of it and you're actually grounded and kind of like, quote, back to yourself? Does anyone not feel like there's kind of two sides of themselves? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, self-awareness is key because we all have heightened self-cherishing behavior and less heightened self-cherishing behavior. And the sign that something like self-cherishing is driving is when the mind is not peaceful, when it's agitated in some way or it's disassociative in some way, but it's not kind of sharp and clear and present. Like when you're having, I don't know, an interesting conversation with a good friend that you don't have to prove anything to. Do you know how you are when you're having a conversation like that, right? Where you're just sharing ideas and enjoying each other, but no one's trying to win or prove or anything. You're just loving each other's company and bouncing back and forth. So you're kind of focused and you're clear, but you're also quite relaxed. That's kind of like your good side, right? That's like you at your best fresh and sharp and clear and kind you know we all have that side use whatever example helps you get there and then you think of your dark side you know <laughs> and when you want to you know pull the covers over your head and tell the world to go away yeah or you want to run around and fix everything because no one's doing anything right and you become a total control freak 
you know, we all have a stylistic version, but you have to know the difference. And when you sit with this, you ask yourself, how does this hurt me when I'm like this? When I'm in this negative self-cherishing, how does it help hurt me? I feel alone. I feel disconnected from humanity. I don't eat right. I don't exercise enough. I, or whatever, whatever you do. And you think, yeah, right. There's a huge disadvantage to me when I'm full of self-cherishing. And then what do I do to other people? Do my family and friends feel alienated, less connected, more judged? You know, how, how is it for them? And you just kind of imagine, because maybe you don't know exactly, you could ask them. <laughs> that might be a painful conversation. But just like, imagine, like, what is it like for them when you get like that? You know, and you think, oh, yeah, right. And then how is it for your workplace? And how is it for your neighbors? And how is it for, I don't know, whatever. And you think, right, it is rough on them when I'm operating this way. It is rough on them. And then you think globally. What's the disadvantage when world policies are dictated by self-cherishing, when world leaders or governments are making their choices based on self-cherishing? And then you can think of any war that ever happened or whatever, right? So you go, okay, definitely self-cherishing is a fault. Chunk. You already knew that before you started. You already knew that, but now you re-know that. You know, you're bringing it right to the forefront. You're not letting your own wisdom kind of slip through your fingers. It's like you're repeating your own wisdom and it's sticking more and more solidly. So then the next time you feel yourself either tense up or flop, whatever your style is, or you hear yourself start to get harsh and judgy or whatever you do, you go, oh, that is self-cherishing. That's not going to do anyone any good. I'm going to keep my mouth shut and my hands to myself and go to a quiet corner and sit until this wears off. Yeah. <laughs> Or I'm going to walk the dog or I'm going to whatever, but I'm going to just keep myself out of trouble until this wave rolls through because I know this one is not to be trusted. Yeah. And then you shift. What are the advantages? Like, what is it like when your heart opens? What is it like when you're considering the welfare of others? And really, you know, maybe around the holidays, you become like a wonderful hostess and you think, what's a beautiful meal that everyone's going to love? Or what's a whatever, whatever, whatever. Doesn't matter. Use whatever example. And you find somewhere where you realize you're really cherishing others without expectations, without the need for validation and praise. You're just genuinely wanting everyone to have a good experience. Yeah, without pressure. And then you think, how is that for me? You might be really happy. Yeah, you might be really calm, but like with that deep contentment. You know that deep contentment that sometimes happens if you're watching children playing harmoniously, you know, and you're just like watching them, you know, like if you have kids or grandkids or for me, my nieces and nephews, when I see them play harmoniously and I'm like the one in charge of looking after them and they're just, you know, being nice to each other and not having a fight and they're just like, there's the happy kingdom. I, it's just such a peaceful space, isn't it? And you just, just... And it's not very analytical. There's not a ton of thoughts. It's just, isn't it lovely? <laughs> you know. And you're really thinking, how can I help these kids have the best experience possible? You know, I got to make sure that we get them a snack at a good time so their blood sugar doesn't crash and they get grumpy. And let's make sure that they get a good nap in there somewhere. And let's just plan out this day so it can be as good as possible for them while knowing that children are unpredictable and cannot be controlled. So, you know, you're kind of in that like, I'll make a good plan and then I'll just let it go. You know, but you're sort of happy in that space and you think, Right, my body operates really well when I'm in that space. My mind is really clear when I'm in that space. And then how is it for them? How nice is it for the kids when you're not yelling at them? How nice is it for your friends and your family and your coworkers when you're, you know, a little bit more flexible? <laughs> when you're able to see many different angles? How is it for them? And you just picture when you're at your best, what might their experience of you be? And then you think when world policies have been made under the influence of cherishing others, what beautiful things have happened. Yeah. So we're doing this as like a conversation or a reflection that I'm just kind of like naming. 
And you can even do it that way as a journal exercise or as a conversation. And then you sit and you go through it experientially. Does that make sense though? Right, how you really are looking at um, this first point analytically and then it kind of, the truth of it comes home. Yeah, and that's just this point one. And that can be its own meditation very happily. And then you look at the ability to exchange self and others if you accustom yourself to it. So you don't think that you have to be at your best all the time or that you should magically be able to do this in its most extreme form. They say if you're really, really self-cherishing, what you do is you like get something that you like, you know, like say it's a, I don't know, a carrot or something. This is the striker for the bell, but anyway, you take it in one hand and then you give it to the other hand. <laughs> right? Like if that's all you can do, it's at least starting the new pathway. Because you know, it's ridiculous to think, no, the right hand owns it. It's not sharing with the left hand. Like that's absurd, right? It's your same body. But you know, just by doing that, you're like, okay, let it go. <laughs> okay, let it go. And then, okay, I can hand it to you. And okay, you know, like, so you just take wherever you genuinely are, you know, with a sense of humor, with some kindness towards yourself, and from where you actually are, just gently stretch, you know, just as if it was physical exercise where you're gently challenging yourself, but never to pain. Yeah. You're not trying to feel the burn. You're just trying to gently expand the edges of your ability so that there's no whiplash or there's no snapback, you know. Um, questions on those points? Let's see, there's um, in the chat, there's one. Um, it's hard to cherish someone who doesn't wear a mask in the middle of a pandemic. So I've come to the place where I say a mantra and clear my thoughts and allow the other person to go without a mask without sending negative thoughts towards them. Yeah, right? It's, um, again, the question is why this, right? Like, of course, it's exasperating when people don't consider the welfare of others, but there's a million ways people don't consider the welfare of others. Why this of all the millions of things, you know, certain traffic things might get to us or certain email etiquettes might get to us or certain world leaders choices might get to us, but why do we let it steal our peace? There, there's something in us that sometimes says, if it's wrong, I have to be upset about it. Otherwise they won't know that it's wrong. And it's like, well, they didn't know anyway. <laughs> You're being upset is not somehow giving them wisdom, is it? <laughs> if I'm upset about those non-mask wearers, that'll teach them, you know, <laughs> like I will punish them with my grumpy face. Like they, they don't care. Um, you know, but somehow it's like we rob ourselves of our peace of mind, almost like we're supposed to, like we have a moral imperative to be angry because they're behaving badly. And if we're not angry, we must not care. So we have to like unpack that a bit because it's a flawed logic and all of us do it. It just depends on the thing that hooks us. Yeah. So um, yes, <laughs> any kind of little whispers of um, self-righteousness are usually a conversation from our self-cherishing, even if they're saying the right thing. And then even if we're right, we're wrong. Do you know? so hard these ones because it really makes you look very deeply on what is triggering me and how is it about me yeah okay so then we have um the last point which is then the stages of meditating on how to exchange it, here in the blue and there's the verse repeated again just as a reference Basically, there's two obstacles. So rather than thinking you have to get something new, sometimes it's helpful to look at what stands in its way. So what stands in its way of exchanging self for other is that we make a categorical difference between self and other. And the way to unpack that is just to understand that self and other are mutually dependent. You know, and you already knew that, but it's like, just sit with it like, okay, the clothes that I wear, the food that I eat, the house that I have, the roads that I use, everything in my everyday life is dependent upon the work of others. I'm flooded with abundance and kindness every day, and I don't even realize it. 
and how quickly things would break down if you were the only person on earth. You know, who would maintain the roads? You know, who would harvest the vegetables? And you just really sit with the connectedness in your place in that. Yeah, and then you switch to, you must remove the obstacle of thinking, I will not make an effort to dispel other suffering because other suffering does not harm me you know, which is what we get into thinking when we're really in a bad space. And you see the fallacy in that. It would be like not alleviating the pain in your foot with your hand because your foot is other, right? It would be similarly absurd to say, I'm not going to help other people because they're other. Fundamentally, it's like, well, even if they're other, they're still connected. You know, at what point do you say that's the dividing line and you're no longer related to me in any way? You can't really do that with anything. It's pretty arbitrary, right? So thoughts, yeah, equalizing and exchanging. Do you have any bits where you get stuck or you get particularly inspired? I think I get a little bit scared every time this happens that that I know that this um, self-righteousness is a big one for me and that it's... Um, I like it. It feels good to me. And I've spent a lot of, I've spent 49 years constructing this ego. And so every time there's something that I'm going to need to like, that I know I need to let go of, it's, it's scary. It scares me even if, so I just was having that like, well, now what am I not going to care about politics? I'm not going to care about the world, you know? So I just, those things come up for me when mm. I, and then the other thing that came up for me was when you were talking about you know, I had these two images of what it's like when I'm self-cherishing. And, and the one is just kind of in this, like the movie scene where the person's being shot at by all these different directions. And they're just kind of, and the other one is like the, the movie star coming out of the limousine that's, you know, just making sure the angle's right for the folks. Yeah. <laughs> like my two kind of like ways that I, that I exist when I'm in this really sort of grippy thing. Yeah, but no, that's perfect to have a visual. They're, they're mine, you know, they're, they're a mess, but they're my mess. So that they, it can be kind of scary to let go of. Yeah, yeah, you have to think of self cherishing and its habits as the same way that you would think about maybe like skin cancer. You know, it's there, it's on you, but you're not like, oh, my skin cancer. I can't get rid of my skin cancer. It's part of me. No, you'd be like, ah, get it off, get it off. <laughs> Freeze it now, quick before it spreads. You know, that's the way we want to think of self-cherishing. It's like, sure, it kind of came from you in a sense, but it's not you. And what's more, it's going to make you sick. Get it off, <laughs> you know, <laughs> cut it out you know, and it's not like you stop caring about the things that you care about. It's you're caring about them differently. You know, like this is so important. I need to not have my ego involved. This is so important. I'm not going to let anger co-opt it. This is so important. I'm not going to get into competitive thinking that says I have to win the argument. I'm instead going to shift to how do we collaborate to a solution and shift my mindset because this is so important. You know, like it's too important for me to ruin it with my same old angry feeling. Yeah, you're just upgrading the way you care. Okay, so in the chat, um, so as the focus narrows from we to me, we also shift from calm contentment to stress turbulence. Are these meditation steps meant to get ahead of that bad habit? Yeah, ahead of it or to change it or to dispel it. Um, again, it's, you know, before you're having a big crescendo climax moment of self-cherishing prior to that, these kind of analyses are very useful, especially when you're remembering past moments where you let your mindfulness slide and you let self-cherishing become the boss and you're using those memories to kind of give you a healthy cringe of, oh, that was not useful. You know, and you're relearning your same lesson that you already learned, but you're kind of reinforcing it. When you're in the height of it, again, it's more useful to let the wave crash over and through, unless you're really accustomed to these ideas. 
If you're really accustomed to these ideas, you can use a short mind training verse or a statement like I like the one from seven point mind training that says, banish the one to blame for everything, which is the self cherishing thought. So when I can feel myself getting hooked, I try to say, banish the one for everything. And it often does dispel it before it gets like a foothold. But if I don't catch it soon enough, then I'm like, yeah, the one to blame for everything is them. <laughs> you know, like you can twist it if you're not mindful enough. And so sometimes it's better to just like let it roll through and say, okay, I know self-cherishing is driving and I'm going to be a bit irrational while it's driving. I need to just keep myself from hurting myself and others until it rolls through and then come back and analyze where could I have caught this? Where was it small enough to squash you know, because once it's a certain degree, you can't. And, and to think of, you know, I said cancer before is the analogy, but you can mix it and say it's also a bit like being drunk. You know, like there's drunk and knowing it and there's drunk and being in denial about it. You know, so like if you're like talking to your friend at the bar and they're getting a bit tipsy and you go, oh, mate, you're getting a bit tipsy. I'm going to take your keys. If they're lucid and drunk, they'll go, oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, take them. Thank you. But if they're too far gone, they'll say, oh, I'm not drunk. And they'll like, you know, cause a fight, you know? So like, how far gone are you in your self-cherishing drunkenness? And sometimes it's really gone into your nervous system and it's really like an intoxicant and you have to just sober up, you know? But hopefully you can be lucid enough within that space to go, now's not the time to send that email. Save to draft, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. So, so this is the exercise and then we get into verses to kind of like make you more convinced or kind of show you the way how. And that's where we did that reflection at the beginning of the day. So that, so it was talking about, you know, first meditate on equalizing and exchanging self for others as a way to develop bodhicitta. Then after meditation, using unfavorable circumstances on the path. So I won't read these all because we already did them during our reflection, but um, just to kind of look at the headings, right? So you're using loss, suffering, disgrace, disparagement, and then you're using being wronged in, term, in return for kindness and humiliation, All right? So verse 12, verse 13, verse 14, and verse 15. That was that chunk, using what you don't want. And then difficult to bear, being wronged in return for kindness, humiliation, yeah? And then it goes to this other section, using both what you want and what you don't want. You know, so it's using deprivation and prosperity, using hatred and desire. So it's kind of like even going deeper. Yeah. So first deprivation, then prosperity. Yeah. And then hatred and then desire. And this, this is where we ended our reflection this morning or this afternoon. And this verse, I think, is particularly pithy. Um, maybe because we already have a concept of salt water not being something that dispels thirst, but the practice of all the bodhisattvas is, is to turn away immediately from those things which bring desire and attachment. For the pleasures of the senses are just like salt water. The more we taste of them, the more our thirst increases. So then we have to be very honest with ourselves or with how do we feed attachment? Mm. The things that we do to feed attachment, we sometimes label them wrong and we say, no, I'm just taking the edge off or I'm just self-soothing or I'm just taking a break. Yeah. And they actually become the very things that inflame the states of mind we don't want to have more of. The modern day example that um, particularly Gen Z, I think, suffers with, but probably it's more prevalent than that, but they don't talk about it, is people's porn addiction right? Like a lot of people are addicted to pornography, which, you know, there's an argument that it's, um, you know, by nature misogynistic and unhealthy and full of violence, but perhaps if it was made in a certain way, it wouldn't be all bad, blah, 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 argue amongst yourselves, I'm a nun, I don't care. But the premise that people say is, oh, look, I'm just going to watch a little bit to take the edge off, yeah, or to self-soothe in some way, 
or a brief entertainment. But then what you find is, and, and people kind of, they talk to me about their practice and then this winds up coming up again and again, is that it started small and short and infrequent and then it grew. Longer duration, it got more frequent and the porn got weirder and more violent or more damaging in some way. It needed novelty to bring about those, that firing of the neural pathways or whatever sort of, I don't know, mental chemicals get released, right? And young, young people are better at talking about this than older people because there's not as much shame for them, which is great, but the problem is still there. Yeah, that what you're telling yourself is a big lie that I do this to soothe or to entertain or to take the edge off when in fact what it does is inflame the problem and then it's never enough, you know? And all addiction is like this. It doesn't matter what the substance is, whether it's substances of the eyes, mouth, veins, whatever, like this is what happens is that you're trying to get the chemicals in your brain right, you know? And maybe it's a response to feeling lonely and isolated. Maybe it's a response from trauma. Maybe it's a way to settle certain things that are disturbed within your body. And that is worth huge compassion, huge compassion. And anyone with any kind of addiction deserves huge compassion and never judgment about the form their addiction takes. You know, the form their addiction takes makes sense given their context. You know, we got to forgive each other for being weird. But what this verse is talking about is for you as an individual, what does your addiction look like? It might just be benign like chocolate. You know, it might just be have a chocolate addiction and say, I'll just have one Hershey kiss to take the edge off. And before you've even finished one bite, you're anticipating the whole package. You know? And this kind of thing sets ourselves up for a continuous hope, fear, disappointment, self-loathing. Hope, fear, <laughs> disappointment, self-loathing. And, you know, some of the forms are less radically detrimental to our health and relationships than others, but it's the same problem in the mind that we all need to look at. And so to break those kind of habits, I think it's very useful to just very honestly watch yourself while you're doing them. Watch yourself the whole way through. Don't say, I can't do this anymore. Don't freak yourself out with a cold turkey before you're ready. But to say, okay, here's my little Hershey kiss. Let's watch myself eat it and see if I can just eat one and then be totally satisfied at the end and move on with my life. Let's just see, <laughs> you know? And if you're really grounded and you're really calm that day, maybe you can, but probably if you were really calm and grounded that day, you didn't really want one to begin with. Stuff like that, right? So this, the more you drink, the more your thirst increases thing is not a moral judgment. It's not a, you're bad. It's a look at how the thing you want to give you happiness doesn't work. Break the spell. Yeah, don't tell yourself you're bad. Break the spell that says this will help because it never did. Some people do it with relationships and they do it with activities and they do it with jobs. And it's just like the next thing will be the thing that makes me feel soothed. You know, and it kind of works for a minute. It's got that intermittent reinforcement, which makes you keep hoping that maybe it'll turn out OK, because every once in a while it does. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no one wants to admit it, but you do. Yes, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I definitely know what you're talking about. And, and it reminds me of this, um, this show Mad Men, where Don, mm. Don says that the only piece he ever had was the space in between getting what he wanted, it, between getting what he wanted before he determines the next thing he wants. So there's just that like space of, you know, and I, and I can relate to it as a sober person of just, you can't even enjoy the thing you have because you're yeah. looking for the next thing. And it's even that way with like an intense, you know, physical relationship Yeah. Where, like it's, you just have this and then it's, it's just, you're immediately like, when can I have it again? And, you know, it's, it, there's no peace in it, even though it's very pleasurable. It's just this like intense grasping. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, 
you know, I, I think that sometimes, um, you know, people that are recovering addicts um, often have the best self-awareness about how this can creep into other parts of their life that are maybe less problematic still is the same pattern it sometimes helps to have like gone totally to the dark side for a bit and be like whoa okay no that really didn't work out i i tried thoroughly and it did not work out um but i gave it a good try you know the ones that come out the other end um often have that great self-awareness and so you know if we haven't gone to that darkest extreme to have kind of the kindness with the honesty that looks at things that are socially acceptable, but are still the same problem. Why look at it? Because it is disempowering you from real joy and contentment that's stable. It's also the sort of thing that makes you self-focused and unaware of the needs of others. You know, it hurts you. It hurts others. You know, that's why we're looking at it, not because anybody's bad. You know, it made sense at the time, whatever it was. Maybe it's something so benign. Maybe you read books before you go to bed and then you get hooked in the book and then you stay up too late and then the next morning you're groggy and grumpy. That doesn't sound like self-cherishing. That just sounds like a, a sort of a habit that you've done your whole life. Yeah, I like to read before bed. It relaxes me, but sometimes I get hooked into the story and I need to see what happens next and what happens next and I stay up too late and the next day I'm tired and grumpy. So what? I'm only hurting myself. But are you? <laughs> you know, you're depriving the people around you of the best of you. You know, when you're well rested and grounded and not grumpy, I'm guessing your family prefers that. <laughs> I'm just guessing, you know, and your coworkers and your whoever kind of prefers that version of you that is well rested, you know, and so it's kind of like just not saying you're bad, you can't. It's saying what is skillful and just very gently adjusting at a speed that feels practical. Yeah, Dana, did you have something? Well, yeah. yeah. I, I, uh... So I stayed up late last night to finish a book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it just made me think about just how, how tricky it is, you know, and how, because I also yesterday, what I found myself doing is uh, I spent the day yesterday mostly doing things for other people almost the entire day and then, and then trying to catch the last bit of, of the teaching. And, you know, I, I found myself making myself this agreement that, okay, I'm going to do the reading. I'm going to read, you know, what we were asked to read, but then I'm just going to sit and veg on the couch. Like <laughs> it was like a little reward, you know? And, um, you know, I was able to see that and see it happen and I didn't do anything about it, but, um, but then there's times that I just, I don't even catch it. It's, it's just so ingrained and it's so habitual that, um, you know, if I'm lucky, maybe when I review my day at the end of the day, maybe I see it. Um, but sometimes I just, I just don't even see it. And, and it feels sometimes too, that it just gets reinforced from all those things outside as well. Um, so yeah, so I was just thinking of that word tricky, you know, my mind is just so tricky. And uh, yeah, and all of us are, uh, you know, I think that it's those times when you did know better to not even necessarily change the behavior, but change the heading or the signpost over what's happening. You know, instead of saying, I'm rewarding myself with vegging out, say to yourself, my focus has reached the end of its capacity for the day. And this is all I have the capacity for the rest of the day. The reward is getting to do a Dharma class and getting to practice. And, you know, that's the re reward of all of my eons of hard work of gathering merit and accumulating virtue is that I have access to teachings and the ability to process and integrate them. That's my quote reward, you know, but I only have a certain amount of mental space in the day. And so, as much as I love it, I've got no space today, so I'm going to do this instead. You know, so it's like you're not even changing anything. You're still vegging on the couch, but you're not calling it the wrong thing. You're calling it. That's all I got space for right now. <laughs> you know, and the cat's like, "Yay, warm lap." You know, it, so it's it's just kind of it is. It's it's rebranding or retitling or re-signposting what's actually happening here. I think that then also your ego is not threatened so much that it freaks out and rebels because you're not saying you, you have to change anything. 
you can do exactly what you've always done. You don't have to change anything except for correct labels. And with enough correct label, there's an organic change rather than a forced one or like a whipped and disciplined one of you should be a good person and do this instead. You know, it's actually, it's just much more fluid and in the flow of your life of gently shifting your priorities and your emphasis to the things that you really value. And when you do the things that are less what you value, it's not a punishment or a reward or something that you need to judge yourself for. It just is what it is. Sometimes we like to be entertained, you know, and to remember that entertainment is also not the same thing as relaxation and relief. We often call it that, but it's actually one more thing we have to process now. You know, and so sometimes staring out the window, drinking a glass of water and just letting ourselves wind down is a nicer thing to do to ourselves when we have no space for anything else. You know, when we watch something or read something or whatever, do a something activity that's just our more fun one that we like to do more, it's actually just giving us one more thing to process. And so that's taking up mental space that then is not accessible for creativity later. You know, so it's just changing the labels of things very gently. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we're all with you. We all have our version of it for sure. You know, and um, yeah, that's the tricky one of I've done it. I've done my good for the day. Tick, tick, tick. Now I'm allowed to do this thing for me. (laughs) You know, that's that's the trickiest trap if we're already good, kind people who are doing our best. Yeah, is that's what self-cherishing will do. It'll co-opt our good thing and then say, now that you've done good things, you have permission to do whatever you like. You're good. You know, it's, it's, oh, it's so naughty that way. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, all of ours does it in some form or the other. Um, so here we go.